Good morning, everyone. How is everyone? Did you have a great evening? I heard there was some parties underway, huh? I hope you've all had your coffee. So I'm delighted to be here. As stated, my name is Hugh Herr. I'm an MIT professor. Um, permanent assistive devices in the form of crutches and canes and prostheses have been used by humans throughout much of the human timeline. This is a, an artificial toe, as you can see. Um, it was found on a mummy in uh, Egyptian times. It's made of leather and wood, and really, really an exquisite design, uh, as you can see, really capturing the anthropomorphic details of the human foot. Um, although such technology has been used for so long, uh, surprisingly and sadly, it hasn't changed that much across the board. For example, here's a knee brace. No, sensor, no, no sensors, no computational intelligence, no muscle-like actuation. It's passive. Yeah, the, the materials are somewhat different than Egyptian times 3,000 years ago, but really it's still passive and dumb and uh, non-adaptive. Non so most of, of devices fit to humans today that have some type of disability um, take this form, this passive form. This is kind of the, the state of affairs when I lost my legs in 1982 to frostbite, uh, mountain climbing on Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Uh, after the accident, I woke up with a very different body and I asked myself, what next? And um, I actually asked my rehabilitation doctor at the time, uh, what would I be able to do with my new body? And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to drive my car. You know, I'm a teenager, right? I want to drive my car. I want to ride my bicycle. And I most certainly, I most certainly want to return to my chosen sport of mountain climbing. And he, without hesitation, said, you'll be able to drive a car with hand controls, but I'm afraid you'll never be able to ride a bicycle and definitely never be able to climb mountains again. And I'm happy to report the doctor was dead wrong. Um, he was dead wrong for, thank you. He was wrong for several reasons. One is he didn't know me. Uh, I'm rather persistent. <laughs> I never give up. <laughs> and I don't like people telling me uh, no. Um, and he's, he was wrong because he didn't understand fundamentally about technology. Technology is an invariant in time. Technology grows and expands and adapts. So what's true in, in when I, my legs were amputated in 1982 is certainly not true a decade and two and three from that time period. So I knew something about machining. I knew something about design. Uh, I was a tool and die student in high school. So I went to the shop and I started cutting and grinding. Um, very, initially I said, gosh, I'm, I'm really kind of lucky because both of my legs are amputated so I can make my height anything I want. So here I'm three meters tall, able to reach absolutely everything, absolutely everything. And when I, went, when I dated, if the woman was tall, I'd crank up my legs. If she was shorter, I'd crank them down. You know. and th think Inspector Gadget. So today I'm standing in uh, these bionic limbs. Uh, each limb has three computers, 12 sensors, a muscle tendon-like actuator. Uh, basically, I'm a bunch of nuts and bolts from the knee down. But these limbs are extraordinary. I can, I can run, I can dance, I can hop, I can do whatever I want to do. Because technology has removed the shackles of disability. So today I'm going to tell you, uh, give you a glimpse of bionics, what's happening in laboratories. Um, specifically, uh, some of the work going on at MIT. I co-direct the Center for Extreme Bionics with my colleague Edward Boyden. Uh, and there's six other faculty in the center. It's a very broad uh, treatment of bionics. Basically, anything that's designed, that's attaches to the body or is implanted inside the body that extends human physicality, human cognition, emotional acuity, uh, is what we refer as bionics. We have four initiatives. One is we want to get information in and out of the central brain. Secondly, we want to get information in and out of the body. Thirdly, we want to build body parts out of mechatronics. And fourth, we want to grow body parts via tissue engineering. So I'm going to, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go through two of these areas, a P2 and P3, and target specific uh, conditions. So one is amputation. Uh, what are we doing in amputation at the center? 
So uh, one thing we're doing is building bionic limbs, but how do we attach them to the body? How do we attach them to the body electrically so they communicate with the nervous system? That's what I'm going to talk about. This is um, Steve Martin, not the comedian, uh, a, a fellow that was hit by a bomb blast in Afghanistan and both of his legs were taken off. Um, using these bionic limbs that I'm wearing, he's able to run up a rocky path. These are intrinsically controlled, however. He can't feel the bionic limb, nor can he think and directly actuate the motors. So that's the next step we're working on. Um, it turns out uh, the way limbs are ampu amputated hasn't changed since the US Civil War. It's incredible. Here's a, in the middle here is a, a, a very old a textbook image, and on the left, uh, or modern textbook images. It really fundamentally hasn't changed. And what, they, what surgeons do is they, they tie muscles down in the residuum at constant length. So when a muscle contracts, it can't shorten and it can't stretch its antagonist muscle pair. That's really bad. It's bad because muscles are filled with sensors. We have spindle fibers in the muscle that, that measure, they're like uh, displacement sensors. They measure strain and strain rate. There's uh, four sensors, there's the Golgi tendon organ, the muscle tendinous junction, and then this state and force information all gets fed into the central nervous system. And that's how we move so well. It's very, very critical. So when you close your eyes and move your wrist and you feel it and you feel its position and speed, and if I hand you a barbell and if you do wrist curls and you feel the torque, that's all the sensors in these, in these muscles. So we want to feed that back from the prosthesis. How do we do that? We invented a a new way of amputating limbs called the AMI. It's antagonist uh, myoneural interface, antagonist, agonist antagonist myoneural interface. So what we do is we have surgeons um, create basically a little joint in the residuum, as shown on, on the left. We have them take two muscles, and we just, they hack the body. They take muscles from somewhere in the body, and they, they stitch them together in series. So when one contracts, the other stretch, and vice versa. When a muscle's stretched, all that information gets sent to the spinal cord of length, speed, and force. So basically, by creating this little joint in the residuum, when a person thinks and moves their phantom joint, the joint that's no longer there, they can actually feel it. And in principle, we can close the loop between the bionic limb and the human physiology by electrically stimulating one muscle to control the position or force on its muscle partner. So that's the idea, and a year ago, we tried this on uh, the first human patient. This fellow is a friend of mine, like very committed friendship. He said, I'll, I'll volunteer to amputate my leg. So that's a, that's a joke. <laughs> so what we, what we did is, um, it's actually true though. <laughs> we, took a, we took a synovial canal from around the ankle and we brought it up and stitched it to the bone. The surgery is done by Matt Carty at Brigham Women's Hospital. So that created a bearing with the, where the tendon slid. And when the person moves their phantom limb, we, we, those muscles are fired electrically. That's communicated to the synthetic motors, and the bionic limb moves. And they actually feel the movement, because they're getting that sensory information to the spinal cord. So um, that, that was the thesis. Would it work? We were really frightened that when we connect these muscles surgically that they would scar down and not be able to move. Turns out that doesn't happen. Here's the gastroc uh, firing and stretching the tibialis and tear, an ultrasound image. So here's our subject. Um, the little black boxes are measuring the electromyographic, the electrical pulse of each muscle. So we built two muscle pairs. One pair controls the ankle, and the second pair controls what's called the subtalar joint, where you use to invert and evert the foot. So here we're measuring signals that you can see. That dot is transforming the EMG raw signal to a, a predicted position of the foot ankle. So basically, what we've discovered is with a simple controller, we can track what the biological side is doing. So he's, with the biological side, he's moving his foot ankle. We can see that. And he's tracking those movements with his phantom limb on his affected side and we're able to predict those movements by measuring the muscle pulse. We then attached a robot to him. This is a two degree of freedom robot. So there's electrodes, again, on, on the surface of his skin measuring those muscle pulses for the, from the two muscle pairs. 
So again, what, what he's doing here is mirroring between his biological side and his bionic side. So when the, when, the anch when the subtailor goes out, he'll go out on the bionic side as well. So that's toes down, um, toes out, or E version. Toes in, inversion. And we'll go again. Toes down, plantar flexion. Toes up, dorsiflexion. Outward, E version from the artificial subtalar joint. Inward, inversion. All right, so that we were kind of excited. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah, but it gets a lot better. It gets a lot better. So about the third session, and this, is, this has not been published, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, about the third session, okay, okay we're ready. Um, we, we had him stand up for the first time. Before that, he was just doing this in free space motion. And he stood up. And he just, he just did this. He bent his knee, and his, his ankle did toes up. And we were like, did you try to do that? And he was like, no, it was automatic, it's subconscious. And then we said, is the reverse true? When you step down something, does the toe go down and reach? Sure enough, the answer is yes. So when you go down steps, look really closely that when he steps down the step, the toe goes down to reach the next stair tread. So toe down, he hits toe first, toe down. He's not trying to do that. So it turns out if you give the spinal cord enough sensory information, the spinal cord knows exactly what to do. The brain knows exactly what to do. And the person, it's, it's like when you walk up and down steps, you're not thinking about it. He doesn't have to think about it. Um, and we did the same experience, experiment with a person with the Civil War type amputation. Nothing happens, the foot's completely dead. So by linking these muscles and doing the proprioception feedback, we get this behavior. So look all the, about all those adjustments. He's not trying to do that. And here, so here he's, he has a piece of tape stuck to his foot, a roll of electrical tape. And he's, what do you do when you have a piece of, a uh, roll of tape to your foot, what do you do? You, you don't do this, like it's too awkward. You just wiggle your toe, like get the hell off, right? That's exactly what he did. Like this is after, this is after just uh, three sessions. And he, he started to tell us that when he started to feel the bionics, the mechatronics, he told us, it's now my leg. It's mine, it's me. So we, we have a theory now, to feel is to be. When a person feels a mechatronic device in their nervous system, it suddenly becomes themselves. It doesn't matter what it's made of doesn't matter that it's flesh and bone or titanium or silicon. It does not matter. So we're, we're next we're going to be applying this to the uh, above knee case. So this animation tells us what we're going to be do. This surgery will occur probably early next year. We're working with the FDA. And I'm trying to recruit my friends to, to volunteer. <laughs> um, so we put the, the muscle bundles next to the nerve. The nerve grows and attaches to the muscle bodies. And then we have uh, electrodes that measure the electrical pulse of the muscle. The muscle uh, amplifies the signal from the nerve. All that wiring goes through a hole in the bone, so the surgeons drill a hole. We then put a titanium shaft into the bone, as developed by Richard Brennemark in Sweden. The shaft is hollow, so we run the wires right through the shaft. And then we attach a bionic, uh, above knee uh, limb to that titanium shaft for mechanical and an electrical conduit. So this will be the first demonstration of an efferent motor control, afferent proprioceptive control uh, in the world. So we're excited ab about that. So what about paralysis? So what if you have a limb, but it doesn't move as you wish? Um, so we've, there's a lot of folks, of course, using wheelchairs, and now you see these emerging exoskeletons, such as worn uh, by, the, by the woman on, on the right. Um, these exoskeletons have synthetic motors. So the only reason this poor woman is wearing this bulky exoskeleton with synthetic motors is us scientists haven't figured out how to use her perfectly fine muscles, her biological muscles in her leg. If we knew how to control biological muscles synthetically, she wouldn't have to uh, wear this uh, exoskeleton. And in addition, if we could somewhat repair the spinal cord, 
um, she perhaps wouldn't have to wear this bulky exoskeleton. So that's the future in my view. This is a mouse uh, that has a cut spinal cord, and of course you see significant paralysis in the hind limb. This is the work of Bob Langer, a collaborator in the center. So what he did with colleagues is he built a polymer scaffold and he injected the scaffold with neural stem cells and he put it in the, the break of the spinal cord. And after 90 days, um, you see incredible restoration of motor capability. This is really, really exciting. Um, they then tried this on a larger animal. They then uh, recently went into human. The FDA, however, did not allow uh, Langer and his uh, various colleagues to use neural stem cells. So this gentleman was the first uh, gentleman to receive this treatment. He only got the polymer scaffold, but still the pilot data is very, very compelling. He would have been completely paralyzed from the waist down. Now he has bowel function. He's able to move his hips and knees. There's still pathology around his foot ankle, which I'm gonna talk about next. So the stage one of paralysis treatment, I think, is using regenerative medicine and trying to repair the spinal cord as much as we're able. To the degree to which there remains pathology, what we should do, in my view, is wire up muscles and take control over them uh, with a, a synthetic spinal cord, if you will. So we're, we're looking into injecting little sensors in muscles to measure those same proprioception signals, length, speed, uh, and force. Those go out through the skin, and then on a, a small microprocessor on the, the electronic button, we run algorithms. We know uh, how walking works, and so we run algorithms on chip uh, to re reproduce uh, basically a synthetic spinal cord. Uh, so the sensor's on, we're putting crystals in the muscle, uh, and we pulse one crystal, a sound wave gets sound down the muscle, and it vibrates its crystal partner because we know the speed of sound through muscle, we know the distance between the crystals. So that's length and speed. We also use an electrode to measure muscle activation, and together uh, we can combine those to estimate force. We put crystals in muscles and you get exquisite length and speed information. It's fantastic. So how do we actuate? We actually use optogenetics. We inject the muscle with a virus and what's expressed in the nerve that innervates that muscle is a light sensitive protein. And here we, we can activate muscle with light. So here by shining light on the skin, there's enough light to get to the nerve, the, li the proteins, light sensitive proteins are activated and we can tr control the muscles and the muscle, uh, the control is absolutely exquisite. So imagine future exoskeletons being these LED lights uh, actuating muscles uh, where there, you have a feedback to the crystals inside the muscles. Um, we're doing tissue engineering strategies with colleagues to run wires and tubes through the skin, so we have a, a wired approach, not a wireless approach. So a digital nervous system will transform us from disability to ability. Uh, in the future. So I'll finish up with a discussion of new identities. This is my uh, friend and colleague, Amy Mullins. She's an, an actress uh, here. She's uh, in the early Cremaster film by Matthew Barney, exploring human and non-human animal forms. In the future, with a plethora of bionic interventions, each individual will be able to uh, uh, adapt their own identity. By adapting their body, by adapting their brain with bionics, they'll also be able to transform their very identity. So identity itself will be designed, will be sculpted. I've experienced this identity swapping myself in a crude sense. Um, so when my legs were amputated, society said that I was a cripple, my life was over. And then uh, 12 months later, I was doing this. Um, a year after my amputation, uh, I was climbing things that no one ever climbed before, whether with synthetic or biological legs. And, and actually, my climbing uh, some of my climbing competitors were pissed off and they, they threatened to cut their own legs off to compete, which is kind of funny. <laughs> so uh, what do you see in this photograph? I show this again, I showed it in the beginning. Am I broken or am I whole? What do you see? Do you see a crippled or do you see the future of athletics? Do you see weakness or the potential for a transcendent human? I think you know what I see. Because of today's inadequate technology, so many uh, disabilities here, so many conditions here result in disability. But we can conquer disability through technological innovation. I have to have, I happen to have the minor defect of that my legs are amputated. It's really no big deal. 
it would be a big deal if I didn't have these bionic limbs. With these bionic limbs, I can do all kinds of things, run, play tennis, uh, et cetera. So uh, we are going to ad ad advance this extraordinary technological and scientific foundation that will ultimately eliminate all disabilities in this century. And that very foundation will also enable human augmentation, extending human capability beyond innate uh, me capabilities or measures. So future technologies will augment the power of the mind, augment physicality, sensory experience, emotional acuity. Um, indeed, Binex offers tremendous potential for humanity, but not without risk. As a society, we must develop policy at, uh, at a rate commensurate with this ever-expanding augmentation technology. Yes, to incentivize further development, but also to mitigate unintended consequences. It's, it doesn't take much of an imagination to imagine a future where parents are designing their future offspring, where governments are controlling the mood of their citizens and many other brave new world scenarios. So we the people have in our collective authority to end disability in this century, to eliminate so, such profound suffering. But at the same time, we need to adhere with absolute obe obedience to what we hold so dear, human diversity, and human individual freedoms. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.